Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, and uh, Ivan, sorry, I always, I, I learned this yesterday. We've known each other for years, and now I, only today and yesterday, I, I learned how to say Ivan's name. So thank you. Uh, right, thank you very much for the intro. I'm going to be talking about common security vulnerabilities you wish your Java application didn't have. Uh, we're going to be looking at a uh, couple of applications, a few applications, some Java. We're going to look at some Node. But the, the implementation doesn't really matter. The key thing here are the vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities of any type can, can largely exist in pretty much most ecosystems. So we're going to look at the vulnerabilities, and we're going to look at uh, how they can, how they can uh, be exploited. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, audience-driven um, exploit. So we're going to actually hack live applications on my laptop, not public applications, just live applications on my laptop. Uh, those applications are going to be using libraries in, in real life, real life libraries. We're not, we're not uh, you know, creating code that we know how to hack. These are real life libraries that we'll show you real life exploits for. Um, so a little bit about me, as, uh, as uh, Ivan said, I uh, help run the virtual jug uh, alongside Ivan and Roberto and Oleg and Anton and, and a few others. Um, and uh, I also run the, or help run the London Java user group with a couple of others and uh, a few other awards and things like that as well. Um, who's heard of DevSecOps? Virtually another one. No, virtually no one. What a crappy name for a, for a technology, right? DevSecOps. They thought DevOps is pretty cool. Let's add sec in the middle, and maybe security will be pretty cool as well. Um, so yeah, De DevSecOps is the idea of bringing security into your DevOps pipeline. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite important because obviously security is important. And, and when you try and pull things like security into your current existing workflow, you want to do it in a, in a developer-friendly developer way. And the right way to do that isn't by having specific security engineers that do audits once a year. Because now with our much rapid uh, kind of development life cycle whereby we try and release every day, every week, every two weeks, we can't, uh, we can't only performance test or only security test once a year because we're, we're, we're deploying so much faster. Um, so when we think about what the problems are uh, with, with DevSecOps, uh, well, Deliverables in a development time frame are, are, are too feature oriented. Okay, we typically have a deliverable that that needs to perform X function. Uh, we don't think about the security point of view. Um, as a result, um, development has sped up very, very fast, very, very quickly. We're trying to release much more often, but things like security aren't part of that life cycle. And as a result, we tend to put a huge amount of code in and then audit uh, tr more traditionally once a year, once every couple of years, once every six months. And as a result, there's no, there's no security focus. We need to start with the security from design. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can uh, think about security depending on your application architecture. Um, ultimately, the organization's reputation's on the line. Who heard of Equifax? Yeah, probably for all the wrong reasons, right? Um, and of course, customer data can be compromised. So you know, we, we need to think about what's right. So how bad is the situation? Well, uh, from a Maven point of view, Around 59% of reported vulnerabilities in Maven packages remain unfixed. That's, that's pretty severe, right? Almost two thirds of reported vulnerabilities haven't been fixed. Um, I mentioned Equifax, and we've all heard of the kind of Equifax breach that occurred because of a, a, a Struts 2 vulnerability. And I'll show you actually that, that exploit uh, very shortly. Um, but for me, one of the key parts of this isn't so much you know, the, the Equifax name, the Equifax uh, headline, but it was how attackers targeted the vulnerability in the technology afterwards. You can see here in this, in this, uh, uh, th this graph, uh, what number is that? <laughs> uh, about 2,500, almost 2,500 attacks on Struts 2. Okay, this isn't anything to do with Equifax now. This is just Struts 2. When Equifax was breached, you know, around here, um, you'll notice the attackers really started to attack Struts 2. Because as we'll mention later, when you attack an open source vulnerability, there are loads of people who use that, that, that library. Okay, so when an attacker has a known vulnerability, they have many, many targets. So we've, we've picked on Java a little bit. Let's pick on JavaScript because it's uh, easier and more fun. Um, so, 
if we look at NPM, everyone knows NPM is kind of a bit of a shit show sometimes. Uh, let's have a look at how big NPM ha has, has grown. Well, it has over 400,000 packages uh, indexed. Uh, these numbers are actually a little bit old. Uh, that's now actually closer to 600,000. And this is only a, a year old, but I, I, leave this, I leave these numbers as they are just so I can explain. You know, in just a year, it's almost had a growth of around 50%. Around 6 billion downloads per month on packages and over 70,000 different organizations or people, developers, maintainers who publish to uh, NPM. So the size of the repository is, pr is pretty, pretty staggering. So if this is your app, your apps look like this, right? A big, a big orange circle, yeah, looks familiar. Um, your actual code, the code you write is probably actually even smaller than this. Um, the, what, what creates your app, what defines your app, is really the open source packages and dependencies which, which, you, which you bundle together in your application. And this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a great thing because you can write a small amount of code and actually start using this huge like, area, I was going to call it a minefield then, a huge area of, of, of third party code. You've got, you know, you get people to write free code for you. Um, however, it's also a bad thing because a lot of the time um, you get uh, vulnerabilities in, this, in these open source libraries. And so, you know, where are attackers targeting open source libraries? Look how much of your application is going to be contained with open source libraries. Let's, do, let's give an example. Uh, how many serverless people do we have here? Deploying in serverless and production? One, two, not, not too many. Um, so serverless, this is, a, this is a, a small piece of code, I think 19 lines of code. Uh, and not too, not too interesting, it just grabs a file and then throws it into Amazon's S3. Um, how, many, how many dependencies, direct dependencies, do you think a, a small amount of code like this might have? Just shout out. 30,000. Two. Uh, two direct dependencies, 30,000 was, was, a, was a, good, uh, a good guess though, but that, that has 19 other dependencies, so these are transitive dependencies, okay, so dependencies which our two direct dependencies also depend on. So 19 dependencies, how many lines of code do you think exists in my application given 19 is all I wrote? Anyone? 30,000? almost 200,000 lines of code in my application. And remember, this is what we're deploying. We're not just deploying your 19 lines of code, we're deploying almost 200,000 lines of code, okay? So when we're thinking about our application, think about what you're deploying, not what you're writing. Um, we wrote, uh, the company I work for is a company called SNCC, uh, and they are a, they're a security company. And uh, they write developer tools uh, for, that, that help you with security. And, and last year, before I joined, they, they, they wrote a report. Uh, they had an uh, uh, open source security, state of open source security report. And this shows interesting statistics like this. In fact, this, is, this, this uh, shows you the, the, the rate of growth um, in NPM, for example. This is only one year's growth, so from November 2016 to August 2017, going from almost 200,000 packages downloaded per day up to 400, sorry, 200 million up to 400 million. This is just in one year. And that, that, that scale has continued, this linear scale has continued to almost 600,000 today. Um, if we actually look at in terms of, uh, in terms of the number in, in Maven repositories, um, you're looking at almost a 30% increase. So it's not as, it's not, it's not as fast a growth as, as NPM, uh, but it is still pretty good. So, uh, ask the audience time again. Uh, we tested 430,000 uh, open source uh, applications, uh, or sorry, websites, to test if they run at least one front-end library that has one or more known vulnerabilities. What percentage of those sites do you think had at least one known vulnerability in the front-end? A hundred? <laughs> Anyone else? Eighty? Yeah, pretty much eighty. 77%. So over three quarters of, of these sites that we tested had at least one front-end uh, vulnerability. Okay, so front-end, it's, it's Node. Okay, Node, Node wins that one. Or not Node, sorry. JavaScript wins, wins that one. Here's one that Java wins. Um, you can see the critical number of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, Java's well in the lead there, so Java's doing well. Um, 
Yeah, a little bit, little bit more than Node, but uh, if we actually look at the number of open source vulnerabilities that are being published every single year, we get this kind of hockey stick style graph. Um, this graph actually reminds me of that. Uh, have you seen the number of times exponential graphs have been mentioned on, on, on Twitter? And, and the graph is exponential. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, what, so why is this? Well, open source is being adopted more widely, but also attackers are targeting open source. And the, that, that, the combination of those two has, has increased this graph. Um, so yeah, maintainers tend to act very, very quickly. Within around two weeks, maintainers of projects upgrade their, 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 their projects. Um, but you know, other questions that I would have is, okay, how are maintainers actually pushing that information that the known vulnerability has been fixed? How are they pushing that to their users? How do users take that and actually upgrade their application, their systems? Um, in terms of the amount of time a vulnerability will remain in code until being discovered, the vul vulnerabilities can, on average, stay in code for a, a couple of years, two, three years, um, before, they're, before, they're, before they're known. If we look at how long, um, oh, sorry, if we look at whether open source security maintainers, sorry, open source maintainers have high security knowledge, well, only 16% percent, almost 17 percent of people consider their security know-how to be, to be high. Um, almost half of those open source libraries have never had a security audit at all. But Docker's got to be good, right? Because Docker's new and cool. So what percentage do you think of the top 1,000 Docker containers have uh, known vulnerabilities? What, what numbers do you think? 80, 100. There's always optimists in this room, isn't there? It's amazing. It's a, very similar, right? Three quarters. Three quarters of, of, of the top 1,000 Docker containers have known vulnerabilities. So open source usage has exploded, um, and attackers are uh, targeting open source because, as we mentioned before, one vulnerability has many, many victims. There's no point trying to look inside someone's private code, trying to find a vulnerability, and then once you've spent all that time and effort, you can only attack that one person. Unless you've got a vendetta against that one, that one organization, you might as well focus on open source and then target everyone who's, uh, who's using that open source. So we're going to hack now, um, and uh, I'm going to show you a number of vulnerabilities, and we're going to exploit a number of vulnerabilities. Um, we're going to start with Java, and we're going to have a look at the struts. Anyone who's, who's working on struts right now, who's uh, deploying on struts? Just a couple of people, not too many. Who's using Spring? Quite a few people's hands went up for Spring. Keep your hands up if you're using Spring. Uh, if you're using Spring Data, quite a few. If you use Spring Data REST, Quite a few. Okay, uh, put your hands up if you've heard of a vulnerability called Spring Break. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. For those of you who kept your hands up for Spring Data Rest, you should have really heard of Spring Break because I'll show you an exploit on Spring where I can pretty much gain access to the system and remote code uh, execute on on that. So, let's have some fun and uh, and uh, hang on. Let me uh, 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 go to. Okay, right. So, first of all, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you my Java goofs. So, if I was to go to localhost 8080, this is my this is my to-do list MVC. This is my Java goof application. It's just running locally, but here I can uh, I can uh, sign up, put my name in. My email, password, sign up, no. Uh, and here I can create some uh, to-dos. So I might say, let's create a to-do. Uh, let's buy, oh yeah, buy wife flowers, that sounds good. Let's, let's leave that as a 1970s task, maybe 18th of February, 1970s, probably quite high because it uh, hasn't been done yet. Uh, create, so it's just a, a regular to-do list, right? If I, if I, click, on, uh, if I click on About, uh, we can see we're using Struts 2, we're using Spring, a very old version of Spring, and we're using Hibernate for probably all the wrong reasons, but uh, we'll see. 
Um, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna exploit struts. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'm gonna go over here, and here in, I'm in yeah I'm in the exploits directory. So the struts vulnerability is a, is quite an interesting vulnerability actually. Uh, it's one that made the big headlines. It's a vulnerability where essentially uh, a request can be made with a payload in the headers, uh, and this payload this payload in the headers actually generates an exception in the background, and the, it's the handling of the exception which actually causes remote code to be executed on the, on the, on the server. So if I was to do a, an ls there, it's the struts exploit. Uh, so if I was to cut that, this struts, actually no, let me cut the uh, struts exploit headers. Okay, this is the content type here. This is the, this is the, the specific payload which needs to be attached onto a request uh, in order for me to actually make the exploit onto this, onto this environment. Uh, and here you can see uh, I'm actually just putting in command there. I'm going to substitute that in later. Um, so what I can do here, I'm going to count this. I'm going to change my uh, command to be slash n, for example. Uh, and I'm going to drop that across to, uh, to uh, that local host URL. Uh, as soon as I execute that, all of a sudden we get all the environment variables off this machine. Okay, I could do a whole bunch of other things if I wanted to here. I could go over across to my uh, env. I might want to just do, let's say, I don't know, ls minus l dot dot or something like that. Run that, and now I'm actually getting a directory listing just from my HTTP request. Okay, I might want to, there's a whole bunch of other things I might want to do. What could I do here? I could, let's have a look if I can see what running processes there are on my machine. So I can do ps minus ef. All of a sudden I get all my processes. What can I do here? Well, I can see what other software is running. I can do a whole bunch of uh, interesting things there. Um, let's cut that struts. Uh, exploit, uh, 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 no, what was it called? Yeah, just struts exploit. Let's cut, cut that. And I'm going to use this one, save my typing. Um, and all we're doing here is we're just actually uh, cutting a file. This is going to be the etc. password file. Uh, run that, and all of a sudden I've got access to my etc. password file. Okay, not as useful perhaps as it once was uh, the etc. password file, but here I can see perhaps what you know what users are on this machine and start trying to hack in as one of those users. Um, I could, for example, actually actually I wonder if this will work. Let's try. This might work. Let's see. Instead of cutting a file, uh, let's try and echo some text to. Uh, a file which I'm going to call slash temp slash test. Is that going to work? No, it didn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, I should have tested that before I presented, huh? Uh, but yeah, you, you can use some substitution there. That'll actually create some files. What can I do if I create files? Well, I could create some files in my Tomcat directories. I can create some JavaScript in my Tomcat directories. I can get people to then run some, some JavaScript. I can alter my application. Uh, other things I can do, once, once I'm starting to LS around my file system, I can look for config files. I can, I can update config files. There's a whole bunch of different things uh, you can do with access like this. Okay, let's talk about Spring. Um, so Spring, actually, have I got this? I think I've got this running on, yes, I have. So on the cloud, on the Pivotal cloud, I have a Spring Break, a spring break application here, which I'm going to invoke. Uh, let me show you the code. Uh, spring Break application, uh, this is just a, a, a regular Spring Boot uh, demo. Uh, in this Spring Boot demo, I have a domain object, which is just an item, has a, a name and a cost. This is just a grocery list, so I can add a, a name of, of a piece of grocery. I can have a, provide a cost for that, and I store it in my repository. Uh, this is Spring Data. The repository part is Spring Data, where I can uh, have this repository. Uh, I actually get a whole bunch of code for free here in my uh, CRUD repository. Uh, implementation. The CRUD repository will provide me with all the CRUD functions so I can update and add and delete. Um, but this, this takes a, the, the, the spring data part takes away the interaction with the back end so I can effectively interact uh, with my back end in an in a implementation agnostic way. Um, now, the, the piece which makes it uh, RESTful is this response, uh, repo, reposit, repository REST resource. Okay. Now, this annotation means I can access this uh, through RESTful services, which is great. I can come in here and I can say, yeah, let's, let's uh, 
do a slash items, for example, um, and this is hitting a RESTful service, so I get a whole bunch of JSON back. Let's click on, uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. Uh, let's click on uh, slash item slash one, and I can get some beans, which is 50p or whatever. Um, and this, this is how I would interact with this, with this resource. However, this uses something called, uh, this uses something called uh, spring, uh, the spring expression language. The Spring Expression Query Language, I think, S-P-E-L. Um, and from here, I can actually execute remote code. So let me go into uh, my Spring Goof uh, exploits directory. And here, I'm going to uh, cat this. And this is the, let me show you that again. This is the, again, the payload that I would need to, would need to pass in to exploit this. Um, what I'm going to be actually doing is, uh, I think I, maybe that's not the file, it's probably this one. Uh, what I'm going to actually do here is I'm actually just simply getting the runtime and executing commands on the runtime. Okay, so this is part of the, the Spring uh, expression language. Um, so now, if I were to, whoops, if I were to run the, let's say, env again, uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, rather than do this on my machine, I'm going to do this on um, a, the, the remote machine. So I'm going to grab this, copy it there, let's delete that, um, and uh, rather than execute it on my local host, I'm going to execute it on this uh, application, which is on Cloud Foundry. Uh, execute that. So now I'm pushing, uh, pushing this request across to Cloud Foundry, adding the, adding the payload in, uh, and all of a sudden, I get the environment variables which are running on that Cloud Foundry environment. If I wanted to, I can again uh, do whatever I wanted here. Uh, well, this is going to take ages, but yeah, I, I can change that slash env, and I can get passwords. Uh, in fact, let me, I, can, I can do that fairly quickly. Uh, I can run, uh, let's cat the spring exploit password, and here I can grab this, execute this, but instead of pointing to localhost, I'll point to my repository, copy that, paste it there, and now I get all my password, et cetera, password from, from my, my uh, Cloud Foundry application or Cloud Foundry uh, 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 instance. So from here, again, I can see what processes I'm running. I can you know, execute whatever I wanted to, uh, inject some nasty JavaScript, do whatever I want. Um, the, the way to fix these, well, you know, all we need to do is upgrade to the latest version. Uh, who has, a, who has a, a monitoring environment where they test for known vulnerabilities in their applications? Like three, four, five, six people out of a room of probably what's maybe a few hundred, okay? So, they, you know, that's quite scary. That's why a lot of people, you know, who use Spring Data REST, didn't know about Spring Break, right? Vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities can exist at any point. Known vulnerabilities can pop up at any point. Um, but what we need to do is understand when they pop up and understand our remediating uh, action, which would be typically just to upgrade our, our version. Let's jump across to, uh, to, um, to JavaScript, because it's always funny to laugh at JavaScript as well. Uh, so here I have a, a very similar, well, it's a pretty bad goof to do application. I can, I can do things like buy milk, and it adds it as, a, as an option. I can do things like buy uh, beer in, with two stars, because obviously beer is more important. So we, we add some kind of uh, uh, bold to that. So buy beer in bold. Uh, I can do a whole bunch of things here. I can remove them or whatever. Um, I've also got an about, oops. I've also got an about um, HTML, which is being served from public, uh, which, well, it's pretty much a lie, but I... Um, and, and what I've done is I've actually run, uh, I've used, uh, th this application is actually open source, anyone can hack with it. Uh, you can just go to the uh, SNC um, repository, uh, SNC slash goof repository in GitHub. Uh, you can download this, run this, and have a little play yourself. Um, but what I've done is, uh, using SNC, I can add GitHub projects. Um, I've added my project onto that, um, so you just click add repositories to SNCC, and what you'll do is you'll get this dashboard back of all your projects, and it shows how many high, medium, and low vulnerabilities you've got. So what I want to do is I want to show you uh, this application, 
And on this application, uh, we have a number of vulnerabilities that we can see in this report that are known vulnerabilities that we can simply remediate by going up to the next version. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, let's show you uh, 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 a, directory oops, a directory traversal one first. Uh, directory traversal, here we go. This is a directory traversal vulnerability in, a, in, in something called ST, which is a, a module in, in Node. Now, a, who knows what a directory traversal vulnerability is? Not too many of it. A directory traversal vulnerability is when an application gives you access to a directory, and they expect you to stay within that directory, but you actually break out of it. Okay, so you go outside of that directory and have access to the file system. So if we were to come back to uh, this, uh, oh no, it's not here. It's this application here. Uh, from what I've shown you, how do you think we can break out of a directory here? Just shout out. Anyone? Say again? Can't hear you. No by explore? N null. N null. Okay, so how are we going to use null here in the in the in the box? Null? Or up here, did you say? Yeah? If I if I go here maybe, because we're serving from public. So what string would we need to put here? Sorry, say again. Slash zero. Okay. So let's do it at the command line. Uh, so if I if I come here and I uh, let's type. I've got some aliases here to save my typing. Uh, we can curl to this about HTML. Uh, and that gives me the, the HTML. So you want a slash zero. Where would you like it? Here or before maybe here? No. Anyone else? How we can break out of this directory? Dot, dot, slash. Like this. If we try that, what we actually do is we get to uh, we get to the title page because ST is obviously ST isn't a, a library which we created. They appreciate some people might try and break out of the dot dot slash, so they actually they actually coded against it. So they say if you if you type dot dot slash, then uh, then we will just send you straight to the home page. We're not going to let you break out that directory. So how else can we represent dot dot slash? Encode. Anyone know the encoding? No, neither did I. But it's slash 2e, slash 2e. So that's the, that's the representation for, for a dot. Okay, so if I run that, then all of a sudden we break out because the library is looking for dot, dot, slash rather than the, 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 the encoding for it. And at this point, I can do this a number of times, many times as you want, because now I'm in the root. If I was to dot, dot, slash, cd dot, dot in a root, you get back to the root. Okay, and then from there, if I was to call the etc. Uh, password file, I can get my etc. passwords. Okay, so this is how we directory traverse, and this is this is actually a, this is a nothing that I've created here. This is a known vulnerability in a in a package which people are likely using in production somewhere. Okay, so this is this is just a, a way of a way of breaking into it. Um, let me show you another vulnerability. Uh, so. Let's go to back to the uh, known vulnerabilities. Let's show you one called um, which one shall I show? I think it was, it was marked, isn't it? That's right. So marked. Okay, everyone knows what cross-site scripting is, right? So we have uh, some cross-site scripting vulnerability in the marked package. Now the marked package allows me uh, allows me to effectively do some markdown. So I can uh, I can come over here and I can add. Uh, I can add this beer in bold. I can do other things in Markdown. Um, so, what would I typically, what would I typically do to to try and run some scripts on this on this site? What would you What would you try? That's the classic, isn't it? Script alert one. So something like this. Script. Something like that, okay. If I run that, 
it knows what I'm trying to do. So it actually it validates the input and validates the output as well so that what I'm actually typing is actually turns into text rather than turns into something executable. Okay, so the marked, the marked uh, in fact, the marked uh, package is an interesting one. It has a sanitize function which does this for us. Um, but by default, for some reason, it's turned off. So what we've done is, to make this more realistic, we've turned the sanitize function on um, to do this. So how else can we run JavaScript? What can we think about? Think about what we do with Markdown or Markup or whatever to, to, to create maybe. Say again? Images? Images, yeah, we could, we could add an image or, or a link would probably be the, 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 simpler, the simpler way of doing it. So if I wanted to add a link, uh, so I can put, uh, let's not do that, let's do, uh, let's do J, let's do J prime here. Um, what I, what I would do if I wanted to do a link would be just HTTP, uh, J prime, is it .io? Something like this. And you get J prime there. If I click on that, it will take me to J prime. But if I wanted to add something a little bit nasty in here, perhaps I could write some JavaScript. Uh, alert one. Who thinks that's going to work? No one. You're right. Because it validates. It's validating and it knows, if I was to double click this, it knows what I've written and it knows what I'm trying to do. It knows I'm trying to run some JavaScript in there and it's trying to stop me. Um, how else can we represent this? So I can tell you exactly what it's falling over. It's falling over on this colon and it's falling over on this uh, bracket. Okay, because it, it doesn't expect them to be uh, here as part of that. So, any any ideas about how we can uh, how we can do this without them? Escape these. Escape them. How? What with? URL encoding. Okay, so if I was to URL encode this, do you know the URL encoding for a uh, for a semi for a colon? No, neither did I. I wrote it down. Don't worry. I got you. I got you back. So there we go, ampersand hash 58. I'm surprised you didn't know that. Um, and I'm also going to do the same here, but instead of 58, it's 41. Okay, right. Do you think that's going to work? Should we see? No, it works even less. Look, we don't even have a little bracket. But if I was to double click this, you can see it is there. Okay, but it's smart enough to know that this is, is actually encoding as a semicolon. So I've really tried to hack this on the back end, but it's not working. Uh, but what I can do is actually hack this. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this one. Um, I'm going to hack this because the browser is both clever and stupid at the same time. If I was to, let me show, let me come in slightly. So this, up, and up to and including the semicolon, is, is a colon, OK? But if I was to type this there, this is a valid statement here. This is not a valid statement because it doesn't have a semicolon on. But if I was to send this, the browser is going to go, I think I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to do a colon here. Um, I'll represent that as a colon for you. So we actually get past the marked sanitize. But as soon as I run that, then all of a sudden, we get J prime here. And if I was to click on that, then we get our alert. Okay, so this is this is this is how we can trick not not the not the library but the browser because the browser is trying to be too clever. Um, so that's a, that's another nice exploit. Uh, I'm going to show you I'm going to show you one more as well. Who uses regular expressions? Who likes regular expressions? So more more people than I expected. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a regular expression denial of service. Okay, and this is in uh, what is this in? Let's have a look. If I was to do a search for an R-E-D-O-S, oops, R-E-D-O-S, this is a regular expression, not that one. Is there another one? Oh, that's spring. Let me uh, go here. There we go. So a regular expression denial of service. And this one, there are a couple. This one is in, not marked, not fresh, uh, MS, okay? Now, MS is a timing uh, a timing package, which allows me um, to do something such as, um, I don't know, uh, buy milk, oh, here we go, buy milk in two days. Okay, so, th so this, this is actually doing some regular expression uh, matching, pattern matching, to realize that those two days, in two days, it's going to put them in brackets as 2D. Okay, so let's come over here and let's hack this a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type, oops, I'm going to type uh, MS2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to echo some content. 
And we're going to be a little bit mean. Uh, that's what I... No, I do want that. We're going to be a little bit mean, and we're going to buy milk in, uh, and then instead of a, a reasonable number, I'm going to print um, a five 60,000 times, and then add minutes. Okay, so if I run that... If I run that, yeah, we get a hell of a lot of minutes, loads of fives, and then minutes. And it pattern matches it pretty quick. And it can pattern match it pretty quick because it matches, okay? It matches quickly. However, if I was to do a regular expression such as, um, I don't know, a, a something, like, something like this, okay? If I was to do a regular expression like that, uh, there we go, so you can see it. A, a plus and an A. If I try to then match something like three A's, okay, it could perhaps get that from this piece here. So it could go A, 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 and it wouldn't need to match anything else. It could match it with one of these, um, oh, sorry, like this. It could match it um, three times on just this without having to break out for that star, or it might do a single A three times because of this star. Okay, so it can match it in, in several different ways. If I was to, if I was to then try, type, a, um, type a B here, it will try as hard as it can to do an, a, as many different iterations and as many different ways of, of you know, finding AAA before it can fail by saying there's no B. And it will iterate through uh, in a kind of backtracking algorithm before it fails. So if I was to do something like that um, here, and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just add 60,000 fives and then make it fail at the end because it can't find minutes. Um, it's going to keep backtracking through all those 60,000 fives, trying to find out how it can possibly match this. Okay? And when a number is this big uh, in, in a regular expression, it's going to hang. And it's going to hang for a fair amount of time. So if I type hello here, my, my thread is dead. Okay, it's still trying to pattern match on this thread. If you're using serverless, this is going to get very expensive very quick because it's going to spawn off. And there we go. It, 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 that pause, you could see, it was about 15 seconds or so. If I was to add another zero on, that would, that would last the end of the day. Um, so this is a regular expression denial of service, which, is, which is, you know, can, be, can be pretty important. Um, so what do, we, what do we actually do? How can we remediate? Um, well, the way to remediate, here you can see the database that we have. Um, you know, if, if you spin through, for example, this, this dust package, the remediation here is to upgrade your versions. Okay, so what you need is something that can, can automate the, the, the testing of this and also automating the fixing. Uh, one of the things that we actually do is we can uh, have this open a fix PR uh, request, which will automatically create you uh, a fix PR. In this case, it's going to actually fix every single one of these vulnerabilities, which probably isn't, uh, isn't a reasonable thing to do all at once. But this is going to automatically now create me a fix PR with all those updated versions. Um, and depending on the Wi-Fi here, hopefully, there we go, it's created me a fixed PR. If I can click on this, you can see all the versions which are going to now be updated and upgraded um, to, to the versions without uh, vulnerable libraries. And if you're using open source, you need, to use, you need to be able to understand where your vulnerabilities exist and what your remediation is to actually jump to the, to, to the safe level. Okay, I've got about 15 minutes left, so uh, jump back to slides. Any questions on any of that so far? OK, we're all good. Let's jump straight back in here. OK, so uh, what is the solution um, to, to you know, DevSecOps, the problem of not having you know, developers or security people in your, in your environment? Well, the solution is very similar to DevOps. Um, you need to improve your team culture. You need to improve your uh, process. And you need to improve your tooling. And without any one of these, um, your, your switch across to DevOps or DevSecOps is going to fail. Um, now, when we, look at team, oops, when we look at team culture and we think about what people actually care about, well, each of these people are going to care about different things. They're going to have different goals. So developers are going to care very much about getting their features into the, into the builds, getting their, getting their you know, functionality out into, into production. Security don't really care about any of that. They just want to make sure that, that, that your applications and your production is, is bulletproof. Operations only really care about stability. Uh, they don't like it when developers like pulling in all these interesting uh, open source projects. And management, well, no one really actually knows what management care about, I don't think. Um, not even managers, maybe. Um, so process, when we think about trying to include 
um, security into our existing process, we need to think about not just creating new processes, because no one likes new processes. What we want to do is try and find ways of pulling in our new practices into our existing process. Okay? One of our biggest goals is to try and push to market quicker, try and release faster. We need to work out how we can pull security into that development workflow uh, and to do that. And some of the, some of the tools I just showed you, um, you know, show how, I, how you can do that. Um, so, you know, the only part that tooling really helps is to automate manual steps, okay? It's not going to help you, you know, in, in much other ways than that. Automating manual steps, the manual steps are looking through the databases to try and find vulnerabilities, being alerted when vulnerabilities exist, perhaps having builds fail when vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities come up, um, alerting you to issues when they happen, whether in your build or in your production. Um, and also remediating, like I showed you, with the automatic, automatic fix into your, into your GitHub repositories. Um, and there's this, there's this interesting, um, I think this actually came, I can't remember where this came from, uh, it, it, but it was a, uh, a, a, um, some, some research that was done that these, were the, these are the four aspects which, you, which you know, businesses, developers, organizations really need to focus on for security. And, and really, developers only focus on the first, on, on prevention. Um, and when we, when we think about uh, prevention, we really think um, about, uh, in fact, who's, this was Bruce Schneier? Yeah, Bruce Schneier. Um, he, he, he wrote a book uh, about attack trees. And attack trees are very interesting. They, they, they basically, you can write an attack tree around your application, and you can try and work out how people are going to break in to your application. Because very often we try and find the most complex ways that people are going to break in and try and fix those when we're not actually focusing on how realistically attackers are going to break in. So in the book that Bruce wrote, uh, he, he, he came up with this attack tree about how we open a safe. And so how could we open a safe? Well, we could pick a lock. We could learn the combination. We could cut open the safe. How do we learn the combination? Well, it could be written down somewhere. You know, we, we might get it from the target, the person who knows it. How would we get it from them? We blackmail them, or we threaten them, or we bribe them. Who knew software development could be so exciting, huh? What, what we do when, we, when we've written this and we've established the ways of getting into this safe, we try and work out what the risk is, what the, how expensive it is to actually try and, to try and, uh, to try and get this information. And you know, we, we perhaps try and work out how we can, how we can stop you know, people from being blackmailed and what they need to do. But realistically, what we actually need to stop is people writing down passwords or combinations and things like that. So this is, this is the typical way which people are going to break in. And once you realize, once you do this with your application and you realize you know, what are attackers trying to get? What are they trying to get to? How can they get to it? This is, this is a great way of writing these attract trees down and then working out what you actually need to focus on uh, securing. Um, we can also look at uh, security based on, on different architectures. So who, who's currently uh, deploying monoliths? Good few people. Monoliths are good, don't worry. We're still cool. Uh, microservices? A good number, and only a few for serverless. What about everyone else? Just don't want to put your hand up, no? So when we think about different architectures, we also need to think about how we, how we design security into, into these. If we look at something like a monolith, you're looking at one, one or a number of very small uh, number of processes, okay? And when you have a small number of processes, um, it's harder to breach. Okay, if you compare that to a microservices environment, um, it's you know you're looking at uh, let's see what's my, yeah you're looking at um, you know one, one process how can we breach that one perimeter how do we breach it when you look at microservices you have a whole bunch of different uh, different environments different services a whole number of different perimeters so you have the the, the, the attack uh, what would I say the, the surface area of attack is much much greater. However, the damage someone will, will, can do if they attack one microservice, once they get into that perimeter, what can they do? Well, services are very limited in their functionality, so you might not actually be able to do that that much. Um, things like people using microservices, um, anyone using HTTP communication between your microservices? Yeah, a few people. Anyone using HTTPS? Yeah, a few people. So if someone attacks and get, actually gets into your perimeter, um, one of the things that they could do if you're using microservices is just sniff, sniff what traffic is going between your microservices. Okay, and if, they, if you're using HTTP, then you're open to a man-in-the-middle attacks 
which is potentially just sniffing the communication that goes through, or potentially mimicking other services, behaving as a service, uh, potentially altering payloads as they go past. So you, you act as the man in the middle, you still pass on to the next service, but you alter the payload, and all of a sudden you can actually start doing a little bit of damage. Um, Serverless, for people who are using serverless, what, what, what people do is they actually have a shared responsibility between uh, your serverless infrastructure and your application. So your infrastructure is held on to by whatever, Amazon or someone like that. They're making sure the infrastructure part is secure. They're, up, they're you know, constantly on the latest patches and so forth. So attackers, if they're trying to attack a serverless in, in, environment, they're not so much attacking the, the platform, because the platform is, is largely very secure, but they target more your applications. So they target your application libraries and things like that. So from, from the point of view of your, of your architecture, if you're in a monolith, then likely you know, you need, you, you'll be a little bit slower in trying to secure your platform. Um, so attackers can maybe attack your platform as well as your application, whereas with serverless, your, your, your vulnerability is more likely to lie uh, in your application. Um, because, of course, don't forget your application, uh, while is very small, the target place for your serverless applications and microservices is going to be in your in your open source repos in open source libraries. Of course, this can be very very similar to um, to monoliths as well as serverless microservices, but it's going to be more common in microservices. Um, so with that. Uh, that's everything I had. I hope you enjoyed the hacking. I hope you enjoyed the slides. Probably the hacking a little bit more than the slides. Um, any questions? Yeah. Is there some sort of sensor repository where those uh, new vulnerab vulnerabilities appearing can be monitored? And if so, uh, is there any way to automate scanning for such vulnerabilities? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, the most common and probably the most well known is a, is a database called the CVE database. Um, which does contain a, a good number of vulnerabilities. Um, there are a number of other vulnerabilities, sometimes platform specific and things like that. There's NVD, uh, Red Hat have some. We actually have our own as well, um, as, as is an open source. Uh, if I was to go to snick.io slash vuln. Um, here we would we would have uh, kind of all the vulnerabilities uh, that would exist in CVE and NVD. We actually pull in uh, from all databases as well as research labs, and we also have our own security team. So this is this is free to access, and you can you can use this. In terms of in terms of tools, when it, when <laughs> you don't want to be looking through this manually, right? Because there's thousands of there's thousands of vulnerabilities, and vulnerabilities when they come in. Uh, our, our security team, for example, uh, on a daily basis, update this several times. Um, so yeah, you do, it's, it's much, much better to have a tool to automatically scan this. Um, th there are a number about SNCC, the company I work for is one of them that, that do, do this. Uh, if you wanted to uh, go to uh, snick.io slash test, uh, at this point you can just put in a, reposit a, a GitHub repository there. Uh, and that will test for free your GitHub repository, no sign up at all, and that will get you a, a, a report based on uh, what you, uh, based on any vulnerabilities that exist. So it's, it's just cross-checking against that database. Um, but I, I think I think the key the key thing is to actually have it at several points, test at several points in your in your workflow. So. Doing this from a developer point of view is good. Uh, doing this for new open source projects that you are thinking about using is good. Um, doing it in CI, so that we have a command line interface. So you just type snick test, for example. So if I was to go uh, in here, uh, where am I? Yeah, that's fine. So if I was to write, uh, Snick test. This is going to do a very, very similar thing where it's, uh, it's querying the vulnerabilities database. So this is di uh, connecting directly to our, our, our database and telling you uh, effectively what I was showing you in the UI. It's telling you exactly where um, either license problems or security vulnerabilities exist, uh, and also if there are um, if there are remediation, you can also remediate if you if you choose. Um, so yeah, we, th this. 
kind of thing could actually sit in CI and fail builds if you have vulnerabilities. Uh, and what you also want to do is use something like, um, like a SNC monitor, which will take a snapshot in production, and then if a new vulnerability came along, uh, in your production environment, you either get an email or an automatic pull request to your repository to say something in production needs upgrading. Um, so yeah, th and SNC isn't the only tool. There are a whole bunch of tools. I'd recommend you, you check them out. Um, but yeah, this, this is this is the way to make sure all your levels are at the uh, uh, not necessarily the the most up to date because the, the, when we try and remediate, we don't try and remediate to you know three le three versions ahead. We, we'll do the smallest incremental change in your version so that we obviously don't break your app. Um, so yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.